So that kind of leads into a, a, another um, topic that I'd love to bounce by you, and that is Santa Ana's. So for those in the audience who don't understand what a Santa Ana is, it's basically a wind that comes off the desert to the mm -hmm. east of me um, that picks up a tremendous amount of energy, uh, ionic energy, um, as it travels against the normal wind pattern down the canyons. Um, and it's extremely dry. So you can get single digit uh, humidity, which basically in some of the stronger ones, um, we've actually like seen a plant leaf and you go out and you squeeze it and it crushes it. It just, I mean, it literally dries it out on the, on the plant within a matter of hours. Now that's another form of energy. Is that something that you can speak on? Um, well, the atmosphere is very interesting and, uh, yeah, they have, there are certain, uh, phenomena like that, which can be pretty deadly and dangerous if things like a wildfire starts as a result. Um, but there's a lot that we don't understand about our atmosphere, um, uh, or at least some of the people are saying these things are, they could perhaps do a better job being multidisciplinary. So like they study maybe up here, but they should also study here. And um, what's interesting about the atmosphere is that it's able to uh, form these distinct zones much more easily than let's say like uh, the earth or the oceans where things are a little bit more mixed and fluid or like and they can evolve very quickly. The atmosphere can evolve very quickly, whereas the earth, moves very slowly in terms of its evolution geologic time I mean, we have earthquakes volcanoes but in general the geology doesn't change much um but those sort of atmospheric phenomenon can influence uh these other layers like water bodies and oceans and and also it can influence like we saw with hurricane hillary like we had an earthquake right as that tropical storm made landfall 92.5 and uh, a lot of geophysicists went on TV and were like, oh, there's no connection. Well, I mean, I don't believe in coincidence. All of a sudden, we, we just saw the data with the micro tremors. This thing was pumping micro tremors out at these low frequencies off the coast, arrived in. And that's, that, that fault appears was at a critical stress threshold. And it was enough to trip that fault. That's what I believe happened with that instance. It was only a magnitude five. But that goes to show you that this atmospheric phenomenon can induce like geologic change, or at least there's likely a connection there. Uh, that's what I believe. Uh, we would have needed, actually, I, I'm sure the USGS has pretty good data on all that because they have seismic sensors all over LA. So it'd be interesting to have access to that. But uh, regardless, yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting weather phenomenon and space weather phenomenon and geologic phenomenon that interact with the environment and also interact with us. Yeah. And the reason I brought up the Santa Ana is because uh, my, my deceased partner um, would freak out when, when the Santa Ana's were here, they, they would just drive her crazy. And as a matter of fact, Poe, uh, the dog doesn't like them either. And I, I don't know whether that was his connection with her or what, but when we get Santa Ana's, he's like hiding under the bed for the day. He just does not like it. And I've been told by a lot of the locals, if you're a really positive person, the Santa Ana's can make you negative and depressed and vice versa. So I didn't know if that there was a correlation in, in your mind as far as that, whether it was draining energy or supplying energy. Um, but well, it def I, definitely I, makes sense that it transfers into the soil as well. Well, I can comment that on that a little bit more. Um, there's something interesting. I kind of... I mean, sometimes you know things and then you come to kind of new realizations about them. Uh, and I had that happen a few days ago. So way up in our atmosphere, we have the ionosphere that starts about 50, 100 kilometers up, and it is a weak plasma. So in general, going from Earth's surface to outer space, the density decreases. At the bottom, you have a lot of gas molecules near each other, but they are still energetic enough to not be liquids or solids, you know, liquids, they can slide past each other, but they're touching. Solids are locked in crystalline structures. And uh, with 
gases, you know, they're, they're able to move freely. And the more energetic the gas, the more they spread out. And so as you go further up in the atmosphere, you have the more energetic gas molecules. They need more space. They have more energy to push against gravity, you could say. So they go further and further up. And so the ionosphere is the section of the atmosphere going from, let's say, 50 to 1,000 kilometers that is energetic enough to be a weak plasma. Not all the molecules are plasma ions. They're not energetic enough to be plasma, but some of them are. And then if you get beyond the ionosphere, you actually get to the radiation belts that those are all plasma ions. These are very energetic. The molecules can actually split apart just protons, just electrons, just oxygen ions or whatever. Um, and so what's interesting, though, is that there's a lot of energy in the radiation belt surrounding the planet. There's a lot of energy in the ionosphere, these ionospheric electrical currents that exist way above us can induce to lurk currents in the ground surface and actually trees and plants connect to those. When we stand barefoot on the ground, we connect to them. They influence our biology. I want to get into that at some point. But down at the surface where we are, we have the highest number of these molecules because it's the most dense. So in a theoretical situation where you have enough energy that gets put into the lower atmosphere, it could be the, the strongest and most powerful energetic layer of them all because it has more molecules that could get ionized. Um, so for example, during earthquakes, what they see sometimes is they see that the conductivity of the atmosphere, like at the surface, goes way up. Specifically, uh, they had measurements with an earthquake at Alum Rock, which is near San Jose in the Bay Area, so just south of San Francisco. And there's the Calaveras Fault there. I used to live just nearby. I've been there. There's all these interesting hydrothermal uh, things you can see there and vents and stuff. And there was an earthquake that occurred there. It was like a magnitude five something. Uh, and before that earthquake, all the conductivity sensors of the South Bay, they started to go up dramatically. And then they, some of them actually went off the charts, like the actual measurement scale, because they're not used to measuring conductivities of the air that high. It's so rare, or they maybe they didn't think it was possible or whatever. It actually went off the charts for like 12 hours. And then the earthquake occurred at the middle of that, zone, that blackout zone. So what was happening was this earthquake and the ionosphere conjunction were basically pushing energy into the lower atmosphere, making it more conductive. What's theorized is that uh, an electric circuit was able to be connected as a result of that. And then the once the electric circuit was able to form, that's when you get a, a higher, uh, you know, a higher flow of current. And that is able then perhaps trigger that fault to rupture because it needed enough juice to kind of break those bonds at the very fault seam. And then you get the rupture and that can actually release energy too. So it's, it gets complicated. But my brother-in-law was down in the same area. He was in Palo Alto. This was last year. It was a full moon, October 25th, I think it was.